What are we doing today? Bring my little stick it notes in here. How are we doing today? Good morning, good morning, good morning. I don't have my lights on. Can you see okay, Marge? Is it clear? Is it need to be brighter? Let me go grab, put my light on. Do that. Okay, I think that's better. Is that better? Yes. Well, I just got a new chandelier in the office. I'm going to show it to you. Look at that. Woohoo! All for my New Jersey family. Just so the lights of Broadway would shine, right? <laughs> it's so good to be with you this morning. Good morning, Facebook family. It's Tuesday, my favorite day of the week. I hope it's your favorite too when we get to dig deep and wide and high and uh, just get to know our Savior even better than we did the day before. It's like that song, every day with you, Lord, is sweeter than the day before. Hey, I love you more and I always got a song, you know that. So anyway, welcome to also YouTube and those of you who may be listening through a CD or online, um, we're so glad that you're here with us today. We have an important chapter to actually finish up. Believe it or not, we are almost at the end of Revelation. One more chapter to go. Unbelievable. And what a journey it has been. We were much quicker than the first time around. Um, so I'm going to jump right in today because... You have your group time, and I have some pretty intense questions for you to consider today in your group time. Does anyone need a uh, study guide? If you do, I believe Sherry's there this morning, and if you raise your hand, she'll be sure to bring one over to you. Um, Facebook, yours is attached to the Covenant Messiah page. Uh, go ahead and download that and print it out and either... Fill those little spots in now, or you can listen to it a second time and fill them in later. Um, I want to take a moment because I understand we have a long lost friend in the house today that we have not seen for a while. So, Barb Balasadis, we're so happy to see you back today. I know you've had a quite an interesting and uh, difficult time over the past few months, but. I'm sure you can testify. He takes us through it even when we feel like we can't take another minute. He doesn't give us any more than we can handle. And I'm just so glad that you're not only feeling better and up and about, but good at feeling good enough to come to Bible study. I hope it's the many Tuesdays you join with this amazing group of people there um, that I just love and adore. So welcome back. And um, we've all been praying very intently for you. So thankful that you're the evidence of our answered prayer. So I'm going to jump right in today. Um, I want to just review and refer back to um, last week's message because it kind of intertwines with this week. Of course, as you know, it, it's the same chapter. So last week, we looked at the beginning verses of chapter 21. John told us he saw a new heaven and he saw a new earth. For the old one had passed away. We made the point this isn't a, you know, Johan, Joanna and Chip fixer-upper. No, this is a whole new heaven and a whole new earth. The old one has passed away. And then John saw this angel who brought down the holy city, the new Jerusalem. And it came down like a bride adorned for her husband. We took a moment and just tried to fathom that scene that John was trying so, so wonderfully to articulate to us. And this is the coming New Jerusalem. And what we've studied so far, we found out that it's, it's epic. It's going to be opulent. It's going to be a place where we will spend all of eternity and more eternity and everlasting eternity. And we started uh, to summarize some of the description that John gave us. And I listed it in a few points. First, we said it's a place with no more pain, no more tears, no more sorrow. 
Um, it's a place where just everything is wiped away. No more physical pain, emotional pain, no regrets, no remembrance of the past whatsoever. It's a place where all things are made new, not just a new heaven and a new earth, but all things are made new, including what we see within the, the, the city. Uh, we made the comment that it's a place where only believers will be and followers of Jesus. We made a note that it's a place where there'll be no need for the sun or the moon. Why? It doesn't say there won't be a sun or moon. It says there won't be any need for it. Why? Because the lamb will be its light and the glory of God will shine through. We found out that there is a high wall. Interesting in the light of the days that we live in and discussions about walls. We found that there's a high wall. And, you know, I made the comment as we closed last week that God is not opposed, apparently, to a wall. Walls just sometimes define things. That's just it. He didn't need a wall. There's not going to be no enemies in the New Jerusalem. And yet there's one there. You know, it's a just defining of a place. It's a defining of safety and an imagery of safety. So apparently a wall does not denote the inhumanity of God. He's got one in eternity. Yeah, interesting. Um, we also saw 12 gates. These gates were uh, like one pearl. We made the comment that must have been quite an oyster. That was part of those making of those 12 gates. And, and also we looked at the names of the 12 tribes of Israel that's placed on the gates. We made the notation that there are three in each direction, three north, three south, three east, and three west. So that's what we're going to pick up now, right there where we left off. Um, the glory of the new Jerusalem is the title of today's message, the glory of the new Jerusalem. So let's begin by reading verse 14, right there where we left off. And here we go. Now, the wall of the city had 12 foundations. Well, we just read in verse 13 about these gates that there is a high wall and 12 gates, 12 angels at the gates, and the names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes. Then he goes on to talk about the wall that has 12 foundations and the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Okay, so the wall of the city has 12 foundations, not just gates, but now foundations, and on them are the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So the foundation of the wall has 12 layers, I guess you could say, in essence. And again, your, your spot when your study guide is 12 layers, and it has the name of the 12 apostles. Um, I find it so interesting because Ephesians 2 says we are built, and the gospel and, and Christianity is built on the foundation Right? Isn't that what Ephesians 2 says? Build on the on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone. So the gates have the names of the 12 tribes, and the foundations have the names of the 12 apostles. So I guess God is not through with the Jew, as I have said from the moment we started studying together, because this is a beautiful picture of what Ephesians talks about, the one new man coming together, the intersecting of the Old Testament and the New Testament becoming one continuous glorious book that we're to read through. Now, before we leave the topic of these 12 apostles, I want to make note that um, Judas will not be one of them, right? Judas is not going to be one of the 12 listed. And so there's a lot of debate and there's a lot of speculation, if you will, about well, who was this 12th one. Matthias, as you know, was picked by Lot. But there's so many believe, and I am one of them, that the apostles hastily did that. They cast it a lot. And the word tells us that, you know, my people are not led by, they're led by my spirit, right? They're not led by lots. We're not led by putting out fleeces and those kind of things. So many believe that they jumped into things a little quick. Because the true 12th apostle was really to be the apostle Paul. So we don't know. Word doesn't tell us. But I firmly believe that that um, foundation, the 12th foundation, will be Rabbi Paul, as I believe he was who was really meant to be the replacement for Judas. So let's go ahead and read verses 15 through the end of the chapter. And then we're going to dissect the rest of it. 
It says, and he who talked to me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city great as its breadth, and he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furloings. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. So in other words, 12,000 furlongs in each direction. We'll talk about what furlongs are in a minute. Then he measured its wall, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man that is of an angel. We talked last week about that's 220 feet. The constructions of it wall, the walls, were of jasper, yet the city was pure gold like clear glass. Interesting. The wall was like jasper, and jasper is like a clear gem, similar to what a diamond would be. And the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chaldoni, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardox, the sixth sardis, the seventh crystallite, the eighth barrel, the ninth topaz, and the tenth Christopress, the eleventh jacket, and the twelfth amethyst. How many February birthdays do we have in the house? Amethyst is the birthstone, right? For, for February, I know, because that's mine. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate is as one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. But I saw no temple in it. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb were its temple. The city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. And the kings of the earth will bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by the day. There shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. And then it ends with this verse of remembrance. But there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or lies, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So, Father, we come to you this morning on this wonderful Tuesday morning. Um, for many, many years, Lord, on Tuesday mornings, we have gathered together to just be Marys, to just sit around your throne, to sit at your feet, um, to, to receive fresh manna. Lord, we look at the world today. We look at just the, the demise of all that's taking place, all that's happening. It's, it's just seems to be such a setup for your return. And so, Father, I pray that you would, you would use this lesson today to not just be words of knowledge, uh, not just only to create the zeal to live for you, but they would be transforming words that would take us from faith to faith and from glory to glory, Lord. And we pray that, you know, anything that we brought in that is burdening us, that has our attention and that our mind is stayed upon, Lord, we willingly release all of that to you so that we're clear to hear what you would have to say to your church today. And it's in Jesus' name that we ask. I want to just say, dig a little deeper into these verses that I know Jeanette talked to you this morning about the situation that we are have decided, prayed about, talked about, and are in agreement about with, you know, the doors being locked. Um, it's interesting because, you know, this is a year of faith over fear, so this certainly isn't an element of fear, but, you know, faith isn't stupid, right? And faith isn't ignorant. And so we see what's going on and in the world. And I don't know, you know, because the announcements aren't on Facebook, so I'm not quite sure what Jeanette said. We discussed it, but I didn't hear it for myself. I mean, just this weekend, there was a shooting in a church in Pennsylvania where somebody just came in. And by the way, for the first time I heard this morning, that the reason he came in was the door was open. That was the reason. That's what he said to the police, was just to simply because the door was open. So I know it's maybe a little inconvenient, but maybe those of you who will run a little tardy on Tuesday, just, just rise up 10 minutes earlier. That's all. It's just not 
that difficult to change for the sake of wisdom, you know, just for the sake of wisdom. So um, if you have any questions about that, please do, you know, help us by not discussing that amongst yourself when you're agreement or disagreement. Come to us and Jeanette's there, Teresa's there. And, you know, we'll, we'll certainly share with you what we've been praying about and how we feel led to do that. So, um, by the way, I'm sure Jeanette said this is not unusual for just us. This is happening everywhere, all the time. And we just don't have the kind of income to hire a policeman to be out there all the time. So this is what we're going to do for now until the Lord leads differently. So, um, I guess, you know, we've been leading you a long time. And I think we I think we've done it well, as we've heard from the Lord. So if you could just trust us in this, that um, it's for your safety, for the good of um, peace of mind and being led by the Lord. Amen. OK, so we're going to look at the last three points um, in looking at the New Jerusalem, because we went through what we looked at last week as far as points were concerned. So now as we continue in the chapter, there's more points to bring out. So the first one is that the city will be large. It's interesting because the word tells us that the road is narrow and few enter, right? But the road to discipleship is narrow and few enter. But when we look at the definition of the city and how John gives us description as the angel measures it out, we see that it's large. It's a large city, verse 16 tells us. It's laid out like a square. Now, I don't know um, what is on the screen. I, I guess I could look here and see as to what the picture Marge chose is, but I put one on my Facebook page that um, gives a really picture of the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. And if you look at it, it's a square. It's an ab absolute square, right? Its length, its breadth, and its height are all equal. So with that being said, even though it's a square, it's actually a cube. Because a square can be, look at it straight down, but a cube you can see from all different dimensions. So it literally is like a cube. It says in these verses that the angel measures this cube to be 12,000 furlongs. However, the amplified version, which I often use, and other translations call it stadia. So 12,000 stadia, 12,000 furlongs, 12,000 stadia, whatever it is, we have no idea what they're talking about because it's an ancient measurement and it's an ancient language. So let me bring it into today's understanding. It equals 1,500 miles. So 12,000 furlongs and 12,000 stadia are equal to 1,500 miles in every direction. So width, breadth, and height, 1,500 feet. Now, if you're like me, I have a hard time sometimes distances and things like that. So I'll give you a little understanding. That would be like from where you are going all the way to so it's a trip from New Jersey to Colorado and then back again and then up that high also. So now you're seeing a little bit a little bit maybe clearer what the size of this looks like. Many say it's roughly the size of the moon. So it's almost like a planet in and of itself, right? Um, one of my references that I've used through the study of the book of Revelation, I think I've, I've referenced this um, writer before his name is Henry Morris and he he wrote a book called the Revelation Record and I've certainly used that uh, for some points that we have had together uh, he explained it this way that if you look at all the people ever born past present and future okay so he's estimating the future based on birth rates and whatnot so all the people this is all potentials that have ever been born past, present, and future, it would be about 100 billion people, okay? Now, if you, if you consider that 20,000 became Christ followers, or not 20,000, 20% of them, if 20% of them became Christ followers, you're talking about the occupancy in the New Jerusalem uh, being what? Being 
20 billion people. 20 billion people. Now, let me give that to even a better perspective. That amazes me when we consider that right now, as we sit here on May 7th, 2024, the entire globe, the entire earth only has 8 billion people. So it's, you know, two and a half times what's on the globe right now. This is the size of the New Jerusalem. And of course, you know, this is all just thought provoking. There's no doctrinal necessary truth to it. Just it's, a you know, mathematically giving us an idea of, of, of what it sounds like. But to me, that sounds pretty crowded. I don't know about you. I was thinking we'd have a little more elbow room. What do you think? <laughs> but the truth is that because Henry um, says this, he says, Henry Morris says that it's 1,500 feet high. And because probably in that time, there won't be any gra gravitational pull anymore. So we'll be able to live in layers almost. You know, God has some amazing things that we probably had don't even have the wherewithal to consider or think. No wonder he said, I hasn't seen nor ear has heard all that is prepared for those that he loves. And he's prepared for their presence, right? So we won't just live peripherally. We're going to live vertically too. I mean, what would be the sense of it being 1,500 feet high if that were not the case? I mean, Henry Morris actually goes in to talk about having avenues and streets. We know there's streets because we just read that the streets are gold, but they're transparent gold. So there's streets. And, and he makes the point that maybe some of the streets will go this way and some of them will go this way. Interesting to think. No wonder the song, I Can Only Imagine. You know, it's true. We can only imagine. We don't really know. However, what we do know, what we do know is factual truth from the word of God is the city is 1,500 miles, 1,500 miles in every direction, making it a very, very huge place, a very huge place. That's the first point, that the city is large. The second point is the city will be beautiful. The new Jerusalem is going to be a beautiful, beautiful place with every precious stone, verses 18 to 21 tell us. It tells us in verse 18 that the wall itself is made of jasper and the city, again, pure gold, but like clear glass. Verse 21 also says that the streets are pure gold, yet they're like transparent glass. Well, how in the world, I mean, when we see gold, right? I have gold on me. I don't know. You probably do. If you can't see through this, this is opaque. How in the world can it be that gold can be gold and yet be transparent? Well, I would say for one thing, it's because it's pu absolute, the purest gold you could ever imagine. And also, this is the real hook, I believe. Listen, the glory of God is going to be so magnificent and so bright and so opulent that it is going to shine through every wall. It's going to shine through every street within the city. And that's why it's transparent because the, when the glory hits this gold, it just, it just permeates it. I mean, it's, it's hard to just even imagine this to any level, isn't it? It also says that there's 12 foundations to the wall. Um, as we look at each of the foundations, we saw that they're a different color, along with the names in the foundation of the 12 apostles. You know, I think it's very interesting because I was thinking about this. The things that we place great value on, you know, the world does place great value on um, if, the, if, if indeed the, the it says that the jasper being that first color well jasper is a clear gem many most i will say commentators bible uh, scholars believe it's diamonds so you know if heaven is just strewed with diamonds and gold and 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 what else um pearls right see we put great value on that stuff here can i tell you that is nothing to god he owns the cattle on a thousand hills and all of the stakes, the filet mignons all in there from head to foot of those cows, right? And not just that, but he made all these things. They're, they're not, the things we put value are, are not nothing to him. Listen, it's like, 
you know, when we think about the streets being gold, it's like asphalt to him. He uses gold as asphalt. What our streets are made out of. But can I tell you what he does value? The gem and the jewel and the treasure that God does value is that you will be there with him. That's what he treasures. The gem and the jewel and the treasure are not all these things that we treasure on this earth. It's it's people. It's people. And, and, and I would have to say, my goodness, I, I think maybe we need to be mindful of that. What are we placing our value on? What do we covet? Are we coveting people to get into the kingdom? Are we coveting things, accoutrements, collecting stuff? I, I, I have never seen, and listen, I'm not putting it down because I've been there. I've never seen on Facebook more sites on decluttering. I mentioned to you that there's more storage units, independent storage units than real estate that's being sold. We got too much stuff. Cut your neighbor and say you got too much stuff. Amen. Well, the real thing that matters to God, he paves his streets with gold. Aren't those kind of things? It's you and me and it's people, the very people that he bled and died for. Amazing. So some think that these jewels, in fact, most think that these are the origins of what we know as birthstones. They also are reflective of the ephod that the high priest would wear. You remember he had that vesture that he put on that had all those 12 stones that represented the 12 tribes of Israel. So I didn't take the time to see if they're birth stones. Many of many people do think that. So the point being, the city will be beautiful. It will be colorful. It will be the most opulent place. Opulence, the, the highest level word I can use in my vocabulary with colors that we have never seen before. Look, it's said that every color, every, all colors come from a three color spectrum. What if when we get to heaven, we find out God had another color? That would change everything from the optical viewpoint that we see things in, right? I can't wait to see it. How about you? I can't wait to see it. And speaking of being there, did you hear the story about the pastor that just moved into a very new town? And he had uh, some mail, some letters to, to put in the mail. And he didn't know how to get to the post office. So he saw this young boy on the side of the road and asked this little boy, hey, you know, do you know where the post office is? How do I get there? And uh, the little boy explained how he does it. And off he went. Well, right before he left, he turned around to the little boy and he said, listen, tonight I'm going to be preaching at my church and I'm going to be telling everyone how to get to heaven. Would you like to come and join us? And the little boy said, gee, sir, I don't know. You don't even know how to get to the post office. Anyway, so the last point, the last point or points in the New Jerusalem is that the city will have no temple church you could say right no temple um no temple because god will move among us god is going to move among us when we're in the new jerusalem remember what verse three said it says and behold i heard a loud voice in heaven saying behold the tabernacle of god is with men and he will dwell with them and he will be their people god himself will be their god verse 22 says we will see his face, okay? Verse verse 22 clearly tells us, but when I saw no temple, and for the Lord God Almighty is its temple. When we look at, um, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, let's turn to that. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am known. What am I saying? Well, we see dimly right now, but then and there we will see face to face. So there's no need for a temple because we're going to walk with him every single day. So, so one of the overwhelming joys of the new Jerusalem, that final destiny and final eternity we're going to spend, is that we will walk with him. We will walk with him. 
we will see him face to face. If you're not yearning for that right now, that might not be an overwhelming joy to you, but that really should be what our overwhelming desire is. You know, it's like that song. I, I, if I would have thought of it earlier, I would have played it at the end, you know, where the man is goes to heaven and he's, we'll play it next week. He's roaming around and he sees Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all these people from the word. And he just keeps saying, but where's Jesus? I just want to see Jesus because he's the one who bled and died for me. That really needs to be our heart right now, right? So we're going to walk with him minute by minute, day by day, face to face. Somebody shout what a day that will be. Come on. Amen. Another reason that there will be no temple is because there's no need for any sacrifices, right? And also worship will not be a place we gather. Worship will be a thing we do minute by minute. As we're walking with him, all, we're going to be constantly in a state of worship. We're going to experience that every day, all day, constantly, right? Let's take another look over at verse 24. Verse 24 is something I want to draw to your attention. And the nations of those who were saved shall walk in its light. And the nations that are saved shall walk in its light. Well, whenever we see nations in the word of God, we're talking Gentiles in, in most cases. So again, here we are once again being reminded that the new Jerusalem is a place for Jew and Gentile, literal followers of Yeshua. He makes that very clear here, okay? But then we look down a little further in verse 24. It says, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Now, again, much discrepancy on that. Some believe because we've been called kings and priests that it's talking about believers, that we bring the glory of knowing him and walking with him into that situation. But then others just agree with that. Others don't agree with that. It, 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 when you read commentaries and look up some insight into this, there's it's crickets. There's really not much said. So this is a scripture we just really aren't really sure at all what is meant by these kings that bring to the earth the glory and honor due unto it. Again, many believe it's believers because we've been called kings and priests, but we don't fully know. So we take it as it's written in verse 24 until we finally see him face to face and he'll answer those questions. The chapter ends reminding us of this once again reality it says, by there will be no means anyone that enter uh, or anything that defiles causes an abomination or a lie, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Listen, we're reminded again, no one can pray you in. There's no limbo for your prayer card to get you out of. There's no purgatory where you're almost being punished. No, you can't. You make or we make our decision on this side of eternity where we will spend eternity and it's clearly that is the names that are in the lamb's book of life now we talked a couple of weeks ago about um exfoliating the name out or or you know taking the name out of the lamb's book of life whichever one it is we have to either remain in it or be added to it but most believe that uh don't blot out my name right that everybody's name is written and that that is very satisfying to my understanding because you know for god so loved the world he gave his one and only begotten son so i do believe all the names are written that will ever be conceived and the only way we're taken out is if we reject christ amen so that is pretty much what i got for today because i want you to spend some time some good quality time sometimes we, we cut that a little short um, I want you to spend some good quality time with these questions that I have. So this is what we'll do now. We'll have some group time and certainly not before, I would say, 11 o'clock. Um, Teresa, I'm going to have her come up and close us out. We will sing a song, you know, as our final send out. But let, I want to talk to you a little bit about the discussion. So what I would love for you to do is I am going to read to you. A scripture. You can open your Bibles and have that nearby too, but the scripture is 
found in Hebrews 11. We're going to read 8 through 10. It says, by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place, he would rather re- that he would later receive his hidden inheritance, obeyed and went. Even though he did not know where he was going, by faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. Here it comes, verse 10. For he was looking, this is Abraham, for he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is of God. Now it goes on to say that many of the others that walk by faith too, they they did in their living time, they never found that city. But I want to tell you what he's talking about here, verse 10. He was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. You should have that open in your midst so that you can refer back to it. And so my question is. Abraham didn't just believe. I mean, he believed in it and God called him righteous because of that, but he did the works of believing. See, believing requires works because faith without works is dead. And Abraham just didn't sit around on his, you know, stone and say, I believe, I believe, I believe. No, he obeyed God. He did what God, and he had an anticipation and an expectation. So I I, I like the way the Lord gave it to me. He did the works of believing along with his believing. So the group question is this, what are you doing? What are we doing that has a direct connection to looking and waiting for the new Jerusalem? I mean, I'm talking exact. And, I, you know, facilitators don't, don't listen to, oh, yeah, well, you know, I make dinner and I, you know, I want to know, like, what's your game plan? What, where is it that God has given you your mission you're calling, and what are you doing, just like Abraham did, because you are looking with anticipation, right, to the city whose builder and foundation and architect is God. What exactly are you doing? And then second part of this, if you can even get to it, is looking at the whole book of Revelation as we've studied, not just this chapter, but the whole book. What part or parts of the book has had the greatest impact on you, and what have you done in response to that impact? So that ought to keep you busy for a good long time, right? Um, So next week, we have the last chapter. We certainly won't do it in one week. Um, Probably going to take three. Um, And, but I will let you know more about that next week. And then I will let you know what book we're going to next. If that's a desire of yours to continue, great. I hope you do. But for now, Abraham did not just believe. He did the works of believing. Why? Because he was looking and planning for that city. What city? What city was he looking The New Jerusalem. Builder and architect, right, is God. So I love you. Father, we just release um, my sisters and family into the next phase of our time together, Lord. And I just pray, Father, for just um, ideas that would just come out at these tables that might even um, help others. Um, I pray, Father, that if there's not a plan right now, that this lesson would be one that would cause you to be sought after so that we would all have our hands to the plow, not looking back, not looking to the right or the left, but looking toward that city whose builder and maker is God himself. And it's in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Have a wonderful day. Love you.